Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. Rabbi Dr. Shmuley Yanklowitz has twice been named one of America's top rabbis by Newsweek and has been named by The Forward as one of the 50 most influential Jews. Rav Shmuley was ordained as a rabbi by YCT Yeshivat Chovevei Torah, along with two private ordinations in Israel. He serves as the president and dean of Valley Beit Midrash, a national Jewish pluralistic adult learning and leadership center. He is the founder and president of several organizations, Uri Litzedek, a Jewish social justice organization, Shemaim, a Jewish animal advocacy movement, and Yatom, the Jewish foster and adoption network. He has written 27 books on Jewish ethics, and his writings have appeared in The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, The Guardian, and The Atlantic, among many other secular and religious publications. His latest book, published in April 2024, is 40 Arguments for the Sake of Heaven, Why the Most Vital Controversies in Jewish Intellectual History Still Matter. And the book we're going to discuss today, I think, should be required reading for every day school and Jewish home and synagogue. And it is called 45 Great Philosophers and What They Mean for Judaism. So first of all, welcome, Shmuley. Avi, it's great to be with you. Thank it's you so much. It's great to be with you. A rare visit to New York City. So why did you decide to focus on philosophers when you have become essentially a walking expert on Jewish ethics and there's a lot of non-Jews in this book? Well, there's the personal reason and the social reason. The personal reason is Jewish philosophy and Jewish ethics has always been what excites me most. I like Bible, I like Halakha, I like Talmud, all of it. But the depth of Jewish philosophy and ethics is what has sustained me as a Jew and has sustained my daily thinking. The social reason is that I feel the American Jewish community is assimilating in a new way these days. In a way where we're assimilating just into the thought of the era and not asking more difficult questions. What and do I you hope mean the to thought, spark. The thought of the era. The thought of the era, I mostly mean partisan politics. That people's views are, uh, their, their Judaism is basically synonymous with anything the Democratic Party thinks or the Republican Party mm. thinks or anything that can be found on Twitter or Facebook. That essentially we have assimilated into kind of a conformist mentality where we kind of just fit in as opposed to what I think is our great gift to be subversive, to be countercultural, where we can ask bigger questions to challenge the societal norms. And why do you think that's become perilous? Uh, it seems like it has. Like there's almost a risk to the honesty around complex questions. Mm -hmm. It does feel like you kind of have to dig in, pick your side. You were just saying that people are sort of warming to this moment of, of hyper-partisanship, right? Of polarization. Right. And I'm saying it feels like there's a social cost if you don't. Mm. We do have to act. We do have to pick sides. We can't be silent, we can't be bystanders, we can't be apolitical, we have to be radically political and involved. But I think that the Jew has a unique role in those spaces to ask new questions and to challenge the norms even within our own political camps. Okay. And I think that the reason why the assimilation is so high today is because we have it better than we've ever had it, even with all the concerns. If we only had Israel, Global Jewry is better than we've been for thousands of years. If we only had American Jewish stability, better than we've been for thousands of years. But we have both. And because we've become so comfortable, we've become so comfortable kind of assimilating into those, those norms. You said that very personally, Jewish ethics, thought, philosophy has fed you. Can you say a little bit more about why? You know, I think back to volunteering in the Global South in a village in Africa where I was up late at night after volunteering all day, working to build a school, and reading Halachic Man by Soloveitchik. And just a, a complicated philosophical work about Jewish thought. And it excited me so much to think about how my activism could be infused with that level of depth, where it's not just tikkun olam, repair the world, or tzedek, tzedek, tirdof, go do justice, but actually huge questions and huge paradigms that can really shift society. And I think that Jews can be on the front line once again for that. So you Shmuley really walk your values. I will say you live your values. Uh, and I'm not saying others don't, but it's very tangible in your case in terms of foster children, in terms of organ donation, in terms of animal rights concerns. Can you just talk about how you are just practically managing to take all these things on in addition to the full load of your career? 
I appreciate your kind question. It's funny because I'm mostly consumed with my own moral hypocrisy, all the areas where I'm teaching or writing about ideals, but not yet living those. I think about the many issues I care so much about, but find such limited time to address in a really deep way. And so that's really where my attention is. But in terms of some of the commitments I have around fostering or around promoting kidney donation, or around supporting immigrants or, or other causes that we're involved with, I'm just fortunate to have an amazing spouse, uh, Shoshana, and an amazing staff team of people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and really believe in the power of ideals, really believe in an era of cynicism that we can change the world, that we can, based on our coven covenantal ethics, really roll up our sleeves and make a difference. You know, this is a time where people are, are skeptical of allyship. Um, they're skeptical of anyone different than themselves in many ways, and for reasons I, that resonate for me, that I understand. But I think that we have to rebuild trust, we have to rebuild connection, and, and develop those relationships again. And before we go to the book, I just would like to zero in on the organ donation because you've written about it beautifully. Why was that kind of a Jewish enterprise for you? You know, it's funny you ask that because one of the thinkers I highlight in the book is Peter Singer. He's someone I disagree with a lot, but also find incredibly generative in how provocative he is. And one of the areas he challenged me on was how we spend our resources. That are we guilty of murder by spending too much on ourselves when we know people are dying who need our resources? Are we guilty of murder by keeping a luxury kidney when we know someone's gonna die of kidney failure? And those kinds of questions, which I think go beyond the Jewish paradigm, but are productive in making us uncomfortable. And I felt uncomfortable with those questions, and that was one of the areas where I felt challenged. I think for me, um, Pikuach nefesh, saving life, is one of the pinnacle Jewish values that resonates for me. And I think that I believe at the gates of heaven, so to speak, will one day be asked, did we give more than we took? You know, did we really commit to being life-preserving and life-perpetuating? And so I felt it was such a gift to me to be able to have that opportunity to, to donate a kidney. I felt so spiritually enriched, enriched by it. And can you talk about fostering for a minute? Fostering has been so heavy because with our own biological kids, there's so many needs. You have four. Four biological kids, and we've often had babies of our own at the same time as we're fostering babies. That's a I, lot. It's a lot. I actually just got on off the phone, uh, you know, with a potential foster placement. And um, it's very heavy, it's very difficult, but it's the issue that keeps me up at night. Children who are neglected or are abused, who have nowhere to turn, no cognitive capacity to make sense of the situation, that's an issue that keeps me up at night. I was so fortunate to have a, a mother of blessed memory and a father who um, made me feel safe. And I can't imagine my life today if I hadn't, hadn't felt safe. So I wanna do what I can there. Mm -hmm. And not only personally, I wanna inspire other families and incentivize, we give grants out to families uh, to, to also consider opening up a bed and, a, and, and their heart and their home. That's wonderful. Uh, you mentioned your family, your parents, and I just wanna touch on them for a minute because your Jewish identity yeah. is not the obvious one yeah. and you've written about it yeah. um, also very powerful in the New York Times piece. Yeah. But can you just summarize for those who don't know it? Yes. My father, he should live and be well, is um, an 80-year-old Reformed Jew and um, is very passionate about his Jewish identity. And my mother of blessed memory, who passed away just a year ago, mm -hmm. actually this weekend, um, was an evangelical Christian and was very passionate about her beliefs. And yet, even though the greatest thing you can do is try to save the world through conversion, through proselytizing, she did not do that with me. Even though she's in the world that preaches, spread the good word, she had a deep respect for my Jewish choice, which I made at age 10, and, and was very nourishing of that identity. Through, from my bar mitzvah and on, even in the last years of her life, we'd study Psalms together, and she was such a God-centered person that we were very deeply connected. There was no conflict, really? That is a little hard to believe. She didn't always appreciate the, the legal aspect of Judaism. She felt mm. it was strict. She felt it was a little cold. That's part of the anti-Semitic tropes around the Pharisees that Christianity replaced this cold legal uh, sentiment. She wasn't anti-Semitic at all, but that is prevalent in, in, in the evangelical world that they're replacing this alternative with, of, uh, they're, they're giving love instead of law. 
And so she had kind of internalized that, that religion doesn't need that side to it. So that, that was a little difficult. And in my earlier years, there was a sense for her that I was choosing my father over her. Mm -hmm. And to some degree, it may have been true. A young boy is sometimes closer with a father than with a mother, more influenced. And it was deeper than that for me than just choosing a parent. But her support in that um, is something that continues to guide me today in how I raise my own kids. And did you choose orthodoxy at 10? No, I, I was a Reformed Jew, I was a conservative Jew, I was ultra-Orthodox in the black hat world, I was a settler living in a settlement for two years in the West Bank, I was open Orthodox, I still consider myself kind of liberal or progressive Orthodox, but mostly I consider myself a pluralist. Mm -hmm. I love all of Jewish life and I love learning from everyone. So you wrote in, the, in a, a Times essay in 2014 and they titled it, Judaism Must Embrace the Convert just gonna quote you, the difficulties faced by those yearning to convert is especially painful for me. This is because my father is Jewish while my mother is Christian. I converted twice. After learning the traditional significance placed on matrilineal lineage, I underwent a liberal conversion as an adolescent. Later, I underwent a rigorous Orthodox conversion. Did you feel like you were kind of trying to meet the gatekeepers mm -hmm. where they were? Mm -hmm. Or was that sort of an internal Impulse. You know, I, that's a great question. I have a lot of respect for my reform and conservative, for my non-Orthodox clergy friends and colleagues, and I certainly support their conversion process in terms of uh, the broadening of, of the Jewish community and feel incredibly grateful. I'm still in touch with the rabbi who did my 10-year-old conversion. Um, and for me, I would say there were two parts. One was that I had moved towards orthodoxy and it was clear for me to sustain th that religious commitment in that community, I would need to undergo another process. And it was also clear that spiritually for myself, I wanted to undergo that rigorous learning and support process. So I was grateful for it. And with all the bumps in that road for me, they were nothing compared to what I've seen for others. And so supporting conversion today for people is something very uh, important to me. Uh, in liberal orthodoxy, where a lot of queer folks or trans folks or people with complicated backgrounds or different finances or races, people have hit bumps for various reasons. Um, I, I, I look to support them in that journey. And do you still feel skepticism from those who kind of snub their nose a little bit? You know, it is always complicated. That We do have to be careful of who is let in, and we do have to offer a, a rigorous process. Um, but I, I, I continue to believe that there are segments of the Jewish community who make it overly difficult mm -hmm. for people to, to get in, and rather than being supportive, view it as more of a challenge role. And so I, I think, and then looking over at, at Israel and uh, status issues over there as well, we've got hundreds of thousands of people who are neither considered Christian nor Jewish. They, uh, their marriage issues are difficult. Um, they serve in the army but can't always be buried in a Jewish cemetery. So it, it's, it's, it's one of, the, it's one of those, those questions in the Jewish community which we're continuing to struggle with, the question of who is a Jew. Yeah. And it's one of the areas of pluralism that we're not going to resolve. There's, there's, there's no case where a reformer conservative rabbi gives up their egalitarianism. There's no case where a black hat rabbi starts to accept non-Orthodox conversions. And so we have to figure out a, a new pathway forward. So let's, talk, let's go to the book, 45 Great Philosophers and What They Mean for Judaism. How did you pick the 45? That was very difficult because I had a number of challenges. One were wanting to balance East and West, although I mostly focused on the West. One was, as someone who strives to be inclusive, wanting more women's voices, wanting more people of color, and those don't emerge until the 20th century. Right. And so I tried to squeeze in more contemporary rather than ancient voices for that, for that reason. And then some of them were just ones that changed my life. My life was changed by so many of these thinkers I'm so grateful for. And some were ones that I actually didn't um, always uh, resonate with with some of their ideas, but they're ones that were so deeply embedded in Jewish influence. They had um, influenced Jewish thinkers for a long time. And so I would say it was either personal or it was just historical and the level of influence they'd had. And can you just tell viewers who haven't read the book, how is it structured? It's basically like a chapter per philosopher, correct? And they're brief, which is nice because you find, kind of feel like you have sort of a semi-mastery right. after each one. Yes, it is, it is not geared towards the academic who spends their whole life on one figure right. and they're gonna go in and out of the details of that one figure's life. It's, it's geared towards one who already has a philosophical inclination, but 
has it maybe in 10 years, 20, 40 years had the philosophy 101 class. So they can jump back in. I remind them who the person is and what their core idea is without getting exhaustive. And then I kind of move into um, what does Judaism make of these? Neither accepting nor rejecting, but kind of um, uh, engaging with. Being kind of in dialogue with. Yes. I'm going to just list some of them so yeah. that the folks at home know. Um, you're covering Confucius, Buddha, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, uh, Moses Maimonides, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Voltaire, uh, Immanuel Kant, Henry David Thoreau. Let's just start with Henry David Th Thoreau, because I know he's kind of close to your heart. Yes. Tell us a little bit about him. You know, there's two things I'm thinking about with Thoreau. One is about isolation and walking. And I, I love isolation. I know I have many friends and family members who are happiest with people. I also love being with people, but my happy place you is- You have like 13 children in your house. <laughs> my happiest place is when I have none of those voices and I'm walking in the woods, I'm on a ski mountain, I'm in a pool, I'm jogging, and then I can return refreshed. So Thoreau really resonates for me, being in the woods, being in dialogue with God, with soul, with self, with, with the cosmos. So that's one, and walking is big in Jewish thought. Mm. The, the, the entirety of the Zohar is a walking conversation. And walking is big for philosophers who walk and talk as they think. There's even something physiological about, about when we walk and how our brains work. Um, so that's the first bit, is the power of Thoreau of isolation and of walking and of, of, of thought outside of society. The second has to do with being radically in society and civil disobedience. And he was so early as really the inventor, one might say, or the founder of what we think of Western models of civil disobedience, who MLK and Gandhi and figures like this are going to learn from, that Thoreau wants us to think about our power and how we can reject wars we don't believe in and how can we reject policies we view as racist or discriminatory or sexist or the like. And um, that how the law does, is not equated with the good that sometimes the good is at odds with the law and we need to stand up and oppose it. Mm. I'm thinking of Sarah Hurwitz wrote a book here all along and she describes the ritual. She was on some kind of meditation retreat where she had to walk through the woods and talk to God mm. for like two mm. days. Yeah. I think it's called Heat Kikan... Heat Bodedut. Heat Bodedut. Yes. Um, and that made me think when I was reading your Thoreau chapter yes. that there's yes. kind of that that discipline that right. we often don't do. Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nachman is the big thinker there on this yes. idea. And it is such a powerful idea that taps into our psychological need for therapy and for voicing the unconscious, that we can only get there through talk, what Freud deals, deals with that in one way, and Rebbe Nachman in another way, that actually we have to yell, we have to scream, we have to talk in a way where nobody can hear us mm. to get to a deeper, la deeper layers of thought. Um, Baruch Spinoza, who was excommunicated, am I right? I have a campaign, along with my colleague and friend and teacher, Rabbi Cardozo, to, that we need to lift the ban, that we need to pressure the authorities in, Am in Amsterdam to lift the ban against Spinoza. You mean it still exists? The ban still exists! Oh my God. The ban still exists. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's not alive, but I mean, it, it was never lifted. I mean, one might say it ends when you die. I mean, what's the, what's the relevance here? But you can't bring books of Spinoza in, you can't, quote his ideas, wow. and so I think that we need a more charitable view for who Spinoza was. And just to give people a thumbnail on yeah. why he was so radical? He was so radical, I think that people mistakenly call him an atheist because he was a pantheist. Um, just as a reminder for folks, pantheism kind of equates, it basically says that God is nature, mm. but not beyond it. Panentheism is more common in Jewish circles, which says God is in nature, but also beyond it. And so if God is nature, then what's the relevance of a God? Because we just have nature, so it's basically atheism. But I think he was a religious person, um, you know, based upon his belief in divinity, even if it was a pantheistic ideology. That's part of it. He's also one of the founders of biblical criticism, which mm. is very early and controversial. And um, a number of other factors, certainly rejecting the Jewish communal authorities at the time, didn't even care, maybe even wanted to be excommunicated, didn't, didn't, didn't really care, he didn't want to be a part of that, but he never joined the Christian world. And there's nowhere else to go. This is not like you, you go take the subway a few more stops and you join that community. If you're not Christian and you're not Jewish, you, you have nowhere to go. 
Didn't he also say that the the books of the Torah were not were written by? Yes, that's another good point. Not yes. just by Moses. Yeah, he's going to reject. He's going to reject the purity of divine authorship, which okay. is incredibly controversial at that time. Um, and one more detail, yes. um, there are many, yeah. you write, before Spinoza, God's relationship to the world was conceived in the same way as the soul's relationship to the body. The two were separate mm. and distinct, even as one serves to animate the other. Mm. Can you say a little more about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's monism and there's dualism. Monism kind of suggests that there's really just one entity to existence. Um, there's a oneness and there's no difference. It's just an illusion. And then there's a dualism. There's a heaven and there's an earth. There's a God and there's a humanity. Um, there's a body and there's a soul. And um, Spinoza's in the monist camp that ultimately there's just one. Mm -hmm. That puts him in the camp, even though he's a, he's a rationalist, also in the mystical camp of one who believes in the oneness of existence. Martin Buber, because some of us yeah. Yeah. at least know yeah. his story. Um, but you kind of made it more accessible, frankly, than it, it's a tough thing, the I, thou, I, yes, it yes. Um, duality. But can you give us a little bit of what stays with you about mm. Buber? You know, something I'm thinking about these days in our hyper politicized time is the difference between Buber and Levinas. Because for Buber, in the I, thou, if I make you, Abby, instrumental for some, some other gain I want, then I have made you an it. For you to be a thou means you are an ends in yourself. And I wanted to slow that down yes. so people understand. The I, it is basically almost transactional. Transactional. It's like I'm getting something yes, from I'm you. Yes, I'm getting something from and you. And it could be from a doctor. Right. It could be from someone right. who's at the deli selling right. me a sandwich. Right. The I, thou is, is just for your own sake. You mm -hmm. truly, I want a relationship mm -hmm. with you. I'm not getting anything. Mm -hmm. I, I don't seek any kind of gain or advantage from right. it. Is that correct? Yes, that, that, I know it's an oversimplification. That, that, that's right. And he's saying that the I thou is essentially a avenue to the divine. Yes. And to the extent that that there can't, if me learning from you and engaging with you can't be extended to other moral and political aims. Because if it, it does, you're now instrumental towards that moral project or towards that political project, right? Now, here's where Levinas is gonna disagree. Post-Holocaust, Levinas is gonna say that actually the encounter with the face of another has to move me to radical moral resp responsibility and political engagement, right? That I need to become responsible for society based upon my seeing your face, mm -hmm. right? For Buber, it's a spiritual encounter, not a moral one. That's where divinity is found in the radical presence that's right here. What makes it spiritual? What makes it spiritual is that there is no other there is no other gain. That one of the ideas of what's holy, kadosh, is that it's an ends in itself. The the Jewish law is that you can't use a synagogue as a shortcut. You can't just pass through to go to the bathroom. If you're in the holy spot, it has to be an ends in itself. Mm -hmm. So too with the human soul or the human face, right? If they are holy, if they if there is but if they're created but Salam Elohim in the image of God, then I need to not pass through them to get somewhere else, but see them as the stopping place. You pose the question in your Buber chapter, is religion about our relationship with God mm. or with other people? Mm. What's your answer to that? My answer is that they're so deeply intertwined. In the, in the Talmud, we have a distinction between Ben Adam Lechavero and Ben Adam Lemakom, the, the um, mitzvot that are ethical and the mitzvot that are between us and God. But those two are not easy to separate. And this is where I'm moved by Musar. Musar, mm. the spiritual development movement. Which is uh, that you're sort of unpacking traits and yeah, focusing. You're, yes, you're developing these midot, these character traits. And in every ritual, there's a moral dimension. That's to say, if I host the Pesach Seder and we enjoy the melodies and love the food and like the nostalgia and the family and the community, we laugh, have I really done Pesach? I might have done nothing. If it doesn't move me to do anti-oppression work, did I do Pesach, right? That actually this is a liberation ritual. So too, if I do Shabbat, which is about rest, but I don't care about worker justice because the worker has the, the right to a day off. If I don't care about the animal welfare because the animal has the right to a day off, if I don't care about the environment because the land has the right to a day off, did I do Shabbat? Right? That there is a moral dimension embedded within every ritual. You mentioned Passover and this idea that if we're not animated actually to do justice from the Seder, we haven't really done Passover. 
But I'm remembering a conversation I had many times with someone you know well, Rabbi Dov Linzer, who's the president of, of your seminary. And we were kind of arguing about the sort of central idea of the Seder. And I said I was raised with a focus on welcoming the stranger because, you, because we were the stranger, the sense of obligation. And he said that his focus growing up was on the line, in every generation, our enemy rises up to destroy us. Mm -hmm. That there is the sort of staying attentive mm -hmm. to what's behind the door mm -hmm. that can threaten us and yes. has for generations. Yes. And so I guess I would ask you, what do you do with the enemy in, mm -hmm. all of the, in all of this kind of the rubric of these philosophers? And clearly you're seeing it through the lens of someone who wants to make these ideas actionable, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. just on the page and not mm -hmm. just for the sake of argument, but what do I wake up and then go do? Yes. What about the person who wants to kill us <laughs> yes. in the midst of that? Well, just to step back, I have a lot of respect for you and your upbringing, and I have a lot of respect for Rabbi Linzer and his upbringing, and both of those very much resonate for me. And I think we're in a moment, if I were to critique um, the state of Jewish affairs today, I would say we generally have two types of Jew, the radical universalist and the radical tribalist. And I think they both get it wrong. The ra radical tribalist thinks Judaism is all about Jews. And the radical universalist thinks that Judaism is all about humanity. And I think that it is clearly about both, that we cannot separate those two. And today as well, those who only want to combat anti-Semitism and defend Israel, and those who only want to defend you know, the oppressed and, and are almost embarrassed by the other side. I think that this is a moment where we have to be so aware of who our enemies are, not just the enemy of the Jews, but enemies of humanity, um, mm -hmm. while at the same time never losing focus on our mission. My, my teacher, Ellie Wiesel of Blessed Memory, taught us that the two ways to combat anti-Semitism, one is to do it directly, and the other is to continue to live our values on the global stage, even when we're under attack, that we mm -hmm. never stop living our mission. And so I think today we have to be totally not naive about who those enemies are and how high the risks are and where they're coming from, from all directions, from various directions. It's coming from far left, it's coming from far right, it's coming from radical Islamists, it's coming from a whole range of types of, of, of personalities and new, new forms of thought. And um, How was Wiesel your teacher? Well, indirectly. I mean, I'm close with his son, who I would consider another teacher and, and, and colleague and partner. Um, but he, I just read his books and feel so influenced by mm -hmm. his ideas that although I only met him once, um, I feel like he's, he's, he's a personal teacher. And the whole, you've heard the very derogatory tikkun olamism of Judaism that many are bemoaning now. And I look at the choices that you make, and someone could say, kind of like, you're so yeah. outer focus. Yeah. What about the Jewish people? Right. Right. Even for a rabbi. Yeah. You know, I'm sure I, you hear it. I critique myself about that. Um, really? Yeah, when, I'm, when I find myself going too much to one extreme, I, find, I get self-critical that actually I'm not fulfilling my responsibility as a Jew or as a rabbi. And I often feel I go to one, too much of it one extreme or the other. I get very enmeshed as a, as a liberal Zionist you know, in that work or in the combating anti-Semitism, and I feel some guilt that that's preventing me from doing the tikkun olam work. And then I'm, I, I'm immersed in that. And I say, geez, am I, am I, am I doing enough for Am Yisrael? And so I think, I think we should all feel a little uncomfortable because the demand is so great these days. Mm. There are so many uh, ways that we're called to responsibility. And I do think that, um, that for many Jews, uh, they've chosen tikkun olam as too central. And, Judaism will be destroyed if we just pick out the one thing we like, Israel or tikkun olam or the Hebrew language or matzah ball soup or Yiddish jokes, and we, and we make it all about that one thing. It's so much broader. And that said, I do think it is what's central. Mm -hmm. I, we have to keep our eyes on the prize that Judaism is not just about observance. It's not just about learning or about community. We have a radical vision to repair this world. And we have a radical calling to do it every day. And that is authentic Judaism, and we should fight to defend that. So you say at the end of your book, may we transform our learning into action to foster a more just, beautiful, holy, mm -hmm. and kind society. Mm -hmm. How do you want people to use this book or share this book? Well, that is one of my favorite debates in the Talmud. One position is what's more important, uh, learning or action. The view is learning. The other said it's action. And the conclusion is learning is more important because it leads to action. Mm. And I think that that is the Jewish story. We learn in order to act. And I hope that 
our actions can be deeply informed by our own personal authenticity, our own personal values, and in conversation with millennia of texts, millennia of voices uh, that have, have asked similar questions. And that can add more nuance. And that after every learning, we have to act, and after every act, we have to, we have to reflect again. And I think we're at a moment now where we need more nuance than ever before in what we do. Because I think if we try to repair the world on the surface level, we can cause more harm. We have to get deeper. Thank you. The book is called 45 Great Philosophers and What They Mean for Judaism. Thank you so much for Thank being here. Thank you so here. much. I'm Abigail Pogrobin for In the Spotlight. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.